even for the Son of God, life was short. Life is short, so put in a tall order for dessert and eat it first. Be happy. I mean, do whatever puts you on cloud nine, because when enough clouds gather, darkness isn't far behind. If life is short, then so is our sight. Yeah, it was short-sighted. We can't see what's beyond our phone light. Even if you are not ready for the day, it cannot always be night. But night is how we live. Do we really live? If we're only living for survival, that's only breathing while we await death's arrival. Like I said, that wait is a short one. Life is a short run. So run to your feelings. Make them feel good. Life is all about what our hands can hold. Right now is all that matters, but truth be told, sometimes right now isn't even enough. Cause what we hold now, what we hold dear, can suddenly, painfully, cruelly just disappear. Life is a short dude, he ain't six feet. And he's a short dude because six feet beneath is where life's nemesis, death, will creep. Just saying death steals the joy from the room. Just thinking about trading someone that we love for... For a tune. Nah, nah, this can't be right. This can't be fair. This can't be all. Life is so small. And death, it knows no partisanship. It only knows how to part a relationship. It only offers loss. It only serves tears. It only comes at the worst of times. It only steals years. It only takes, it never gives. Well, it gives zero cares about who you wanted to live. Took my dad, took your mom. It stole your brother. Your sister should still be here, but no, just tears. And we would beg and beg for us to be the one, and yet death still had the apathy to come for your son you're a little girl who is safe in this world even Jesus Lazarus was his friend and he cried when he arrived to find him dead death didn't stop until it even claimed Jesus in the end are you just trying to survive until you die or are you truly living? And is it possible there is something even better than life itself? We've all been to far too many funerals over the past two years. And that's right. We've, we've buried those we've loved. Your grandparents, maybe your father or your mother, your friends, maybe your sister, or even like me, your brother, or maybe you lost a child and you're heartbroken and you're grief stricken. But what compounds the grief is not just the loss, but that it forces you to face your own mortality. You begin to wrestle with the questions and the meaning. I know for Laura and I, after my brother's funeral, we felt like we needed to, you know, look at our own will, have conversations about preparing for our own passing. Would our family be in order? Would they be okay? No, they're not going to be okay. But have we done everything we can to put things in order? And so how are you handling it? You know, facing the reality of death, maybe for you, the way you've dealt with it is just ignore it, you know, denial. Or maybe you've gotten angry. Hey, that's a part of grieving. Maybe you're bargaining. Maybe you're in depression. Maybe you're living in fear, terrified by the possibility of death hitting your door. Or maybe, maybe you're driven to just Take advantage of every moment trying to seize the day, aware that it could pass at any moment. But you know, funerals 
are not just a place and space to celebrate the life and mourn the death of the one you've lost. It's a sacred space. You know, it's a space where the temporary meets the eternal. Because you and I both know that when you go to a viewing or after the funeral and you, you're looking at the body, we've all said they're not home. Their body is just a, a shell. What does God have to say about death? Well, I appreciate that in the story of God, as he interacts with man, man, God did not avoid the issue of death. I mean, it does seem unavoidable. But as you go through the story of God in the Bible, you discover that death is an important part of that story. God hit it head on. In fact, Jesus himself faced death head on. But he didn't just face death head on in his own life. He lost those he loved. In fact, one day Jesus shows up days late to a funeral, to the funeral of his friend and a family that he loved. The story is recorded in the Gospel of John. John's an eyewitness to this moment where Jesus and his friends, his closest friends, his disciples, they show up days late to a funeral of their friend Lazarus. And so I'm going to read it in John chapter 11. On his arrival, I mean, when Jesus showed up, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb for four days. He wasn't just a little late to the funeral. I mean, he shows up days late. And maybe you feel like that. Maybe you're looking around going, where was Jesus? He's late to the funeral. In fact, that's how the family responds. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. Right? She puts words to how we all feel. Jesus, if, if you had been there, they wouldn't have passed. If you had done a miracle, if you had healed them, they would still be here. Why? Because we, we, we recognize life's futility and death's finality. And what we want is for God to show up and do a miracle so that we could still have them with us. They could be alive a little bit longer, maybe one more moment, one more day. Maybe you feel like they should have had an entire lifetime ahead of them. But God, through the person of Jesus, he offers something better, better than what we had before. Because what we want is longer life for those we love and for ourselves. But God always offers something better. That's right. So it's a challenge and an invitation. Don't just live longer. Live forever. That's right. You're invited not just to have longer life, but to live forever. This is the message and the meaning of Easter. It's not just a message that Jesus preached or a message Jesus shared. It was a message he lived and died. It was the mission of his life to invite us to not just live longer, but live forever. Because the reality is we have lost loved ones and we will again. We've grieved and we will grieve more. But have you ever noticed something interesting at every funeral? We have this feeling. This is not how it's supposed to be. There's something deep inside of us that said, yes, even though death is such a natural part of life, it wasn't intended to be this way. That's right. You're absolutely right. We were never meant to die. It wasn't meant to be this way. No, we live in a broken world where life itself is broken as a result of something spiritually broken in the world around us and in us. That's right. You and I are spiritually broken. Those you've loved are spiritually broken. And this curse, this spiritual curse causes a natural death. The symptom of this spiritual curse is death itself. That spiritual curse is called sin. 
It has ruined the world we live in. It's ruined history. It, it ruins your story and my story and their story. Sin infects anyone and everyone and no one escapes it. Sin is being separated from God forever. But God, but God shows up and he intervenes in our story and their story and he intervened in Lazarus' story. He gave Martha this promise and it's a promise that he gives to every one of us. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. It's a promise. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks Martha, do you believe me? Do you believe this? And that's what I would challenge and ask every one of you. Do you believe this? That Jesus is the resurrection and the life. It's what we celebrate at Easter. It's the whole story and the promise of Christianity that death doesn't get the final word. Life doesn't end in death. Death ends in forever life. And so why did Jesus come? Just to show up late to a funeral and give a promise that I am the resurrection and the life? No, he came to take on our fight with death itself, to take on the curse of sin. And so Jesus, he didn't just give a promise to Martha and the family. He fulfilled that promise later in his own death. He had to die. He had to die to take on the curse of sin because the sin inside of every one of us, the curse leads to a forever death. I don't just mean non-existence. I mean a forever separated from God and all that is good in eternal judgment. That's the bad news. But the good news is that when Jesus died, he faced our fight with death and he died in our place, but not just a physical death. Jesus on the cross was absorbing our eternal judgment. He absorbed all of the eternal shame and guilt, the eternal payment that we owe for the sin that's cursed our hearts. So when Jesus died, he died once for all. But in the power of his resurrection, the victory of his resurrection, when he rose from the dead, he gave us the promise of eternal life so that he could fulfill a promise he gave to a grieving family. You see, Friday, Jesus was crucified. Not because he deserved to die, but because we deserve to die. Saturday, he stayed still, dead in the tomb. But Sunday, Sunday told a very different story. For the earth began to shake, and the veil was torn. What sacrifice was made as the
in Jesus' death, He freed us from the grip of sin and the curse of sin. But in the power of his resurrection, what we celebrate at Easter, here's what I want you to know. Jesus put death to death. That's right. He is a death killer. In in his burial, he was laid to rest on our behalf. But in the power of his resurrection, he gave us victory over death. He conquered and defeated the power of eternal judgment and set us free. That's the promise. That's the hope. Now, as you jump back into the story of Lazarus, Jesus gave this promise. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I'm going to give away the rest of the story. In a few moments, Jesus was going to call out Lazarus's name and he was going to rise from the dead and Jesus was going to restore Lazarus back to his family and friends. But there's a gap. There's always a gap between the promise and the reality. And right now, you and I live in the gap. We live between the promise that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and seeing that in the reality of heaven. And what does Jesus do in the gap? Well, if you go back into the story, there's this moment. Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And then he says this, where have you laid him? He asked, come and see, Lord. And as they walk to the tomb where Lazarus was buried, says, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible. And so often when I've read that verse, I thought it reveals Jesus' humanity. It reveals his compassion and his tenderness. But there's something more there. Between the promise of the resurrection and the life and the reality of seeing that resurrection lived out in your life and seeing those again who you've lost and loved, but meeting them in eternity, right? In that gap, You know what God is doing with you? He weeps. You're weeping. You feel the hurt and the pain. You feel the grief. And Jesus, in that gap between the promise and the reality, weeps with a broken family. He weeps with friends. And I want you to know that God weeps with you. That's right. You have a God who weeps in your grief, in your loss, In your pain, you have a God who knows you, who loves you, who sees you, who feels that. Even though he knows he's giving resurrection life, even though he knows he's going to raise the dead, even though he knows in an instant death gives way to life, he still grieves with those who grieve. He still weeps with those who weep. But then there's this moment. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out of the tomb. And I'm like, come on, are you kidding me? That's right. Jesus raises the dead back to life. But I want you to catch something. It's it's vitally important, both in this story and as we celebrate Easter. It's this, that resurrection life is better than longer life. It's important. It's important to take that to heart. What God gives in resurrection life is better than just living longer. I know. I know that you want those who you've loved to live longer. And I know for many of us, we just want longer life. But what God gives is better than what you've ever had before. And that is he gives resurrection life. So let's look at the difference between Lazarus' resurrection and Jesus' resurrection. See, when Lazarus was resurrected, he would still get sick again. He he was going to have to face death again. The the curse of sin was still going to be at work in his body, leading to an eventual death. And without spiritual life at work in him, he would not only die again physically, but he would be facing a forever death without Jesus' resurrection. But when Jesus died, he died for all of us. And when Jesus rose, he rose in victory over death itself. His resurrection allowed for all of us to experience resurrection. See, resurrection life is not a religious experience. This isn't that you and I are all through faith just facing our version of eternity or some promised mystical hope in a heaven. 
Resurrection life is found in the person of Jesus. Without Jesus, no life. But when you know Jesus, you know true and forever and eternal life. See, what God does is he plants the seed of resurrection life inside of you right now through faith in Jesus. And when you have that seed of resurrection life inside of you, what he planted in Lazarus, what he offered through his death and the power of his resurrection that we celebrate on Easter is that resurrection life can be planted inside of anyone and everyone who believes in Jesus by faith. And whether anyone sees it or not, when you've got resurrection life growing inside of you, like a seed that begins to germinate, the roots begin to grow, resurrection life begins to grow deep down into your heart, through your spirit. It begins to grow roots into your emotions and into your thinking, into your actions and your behavior. So when someone dies, they didn't live longer, but they know Jesus They've already had resurrection life growing in them, which is better than longer life, and they just transition. Death just becomes a doorway into that true, eternal, and forever life that was already living and growing deep inside of them. Do you have that seed of resurrection life growing in you now? If not, you can receive that seed through faith in Jesus Christ, and God's Holy Spirit wants to come in and begin to live in you. And as His Spirit lives in you, He brings with Him the seed of resurrection life that begins to grow in you so that when someone dies, I know we think, man, they rest in peace. No, they're awake for the very first time. They're going into darkness. They're going into the shadows. No, when they die and they're, they're alive in eternity and in paradise, they are awake for the very first time. They see for the very first time. They experience light and life in a way that you and I could never experience it in this life. So we grieve but we do not grieve as those without hope and we have the promise of resurrection life because resurrection life is just better than living longer. But there, there's another part to this story. It's this. When Jesus calls uh, Lazarus come out, he, here's what happens. It says this, right? The dead man came out. Lazarus comes out of the tomb. But, but listen to how he looks. His hands and feet are wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This is an interesting story. I mean, Jesus has the power to speak and life enters a dead man. I mean, you don't think that he could have spoken in his normal clothes would have been on him. But there was something necessary about Lazarus coming out of the tomb, still clothed in grave clothes because that's kind of our experience in the gap between the promise of resurrection life and the reality of resurrection life. It's, it's like we live with grave clothes on that have to be taken off. As you begin to experience and encounter the resurrection life, it's as if you're unwrapping grave clothes. See, resurrection life means you're not living for today. When you experience resurrection life, you don't live for today. You, you have these grave clothes on reminding you that you have to live forever. You're living for eternity. In fact, after Jesus raises Lazarus back to life, friends and family are celebrating. They're reunited with the one they love. But the religious leaders are angry. In fact, they begin to plot, and their plot is that they're going to kill Jesus. And I've always found this ironic. Jesus raises the dead, and these religious leaders hate him, and they want to kill him. And so if you read just a few verses later in John chapter 11, the high priest at the time, the lead religious leader, says, you don't realize that it, that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. Now, he, he didn't just say that on his own, as scripture says, that he was saying this almost prophetically. It was foreshadowing that Jesus was going to die on behalf of the whole world. But what he meant was, it's better to kill one man so that Rome doesn't crush us for this rebellion. 
And, and then it continues. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Jesus is raising the dead. They're plotting on putting someone to death. But here's what's important. In that moment, what you recognize is that Jesus wasn't living for today. He was on mission, and his mission was a message of resurrection life, and his, mis- his mission was to die so that we could live forever. His mission was the cross and the empty tomb for you and I. When we believe in Jesus by faith and his resurrection life is living inside of us, our whole perspective shifts. Our entire view changes so we no longer are looking at how we can get the most out of today, how we can only live for today. We start living for eternity. The apostle Paul wrote several letters. They're included in the New Testament of the Bible. One of them is uh, his first letter to the church in Corinth, where at the end of the letter, He's, he's uh, recognizing that people wrestle with this idea of what does resurrection life look like inside of us? And he says, you know, the body that you're in is nothing like the body you're going to experience in eternity. And then he shifts his focus and he says, hey, you live different when you recognize that you'll live forever. And so he writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I want to read a few verses too. He says this, death has been swallowed up in victory. He's giving you that promise. He's reminding you that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he gives a little, a little battle taunt. He goes, where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death is your sting. We've all felt the sting of death. We've all been injured by the defeat of death. But he's saying, no, death doesn't get the last word. Death doesn't get the victory. Death doesn't even have a sting anymore. When you believe in Jesus by faith, he goes, but... Thanks be to God. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes like this. Therefore, in light of that promise, in light of that victory, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Don't be shaken. Don't be running in fear. Don't be living in fear. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Let nothing get you on your heels running from what's best. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's right. When you live for eternity, you work for eternity. You you serve God by serving others because you don't have to serve yourself because it's not all about you. It's not all about you getting the most out of the moment. You know that you're going to live forever. And because you're going to live forever, you can live for God today. You can give God your very best. And you give God your best by serving him, by serving others, by giving others your best, by being fully present in the moment, by not hoarding and being selfish, but serving and being selfless. Rather than being greedy, you can be generous. Rather than expecting others to always look out for your needs, you can care about the needs of others. You, you see how eternity flips everything around. It completely transforms your perspective and you no longer live for today, but you live for eternity. You have forever in mind, even in the here and now. So I'm gonna invite you. How do you need to begin to live for eternity rather than only living for today? How can you experience the resurrection life of God in you right now. So I want to encourage you, would you take a moment right now? I'm going to ask all of you, would you just close your eyes for a moment? I want this to be a moment between you and God, similar to Jesus asking Mary, do you believe this? I want to challenge you right now. Do you believe this? Now you're you're joining us online and I want to invite you, would you respond with me? Maybe for the first time you're saying, yes, I believe this. I want to receive that seed of resurrection life inside of me. If you're making that decision, I want you to say yes to Jesus. And then would you let us know? You can let us know by texting the name Jesus to 81411. And as you're saying yes to Jesus and you're letting us know right now, someone's going to follow up with you and encourage you as you begin this new journey of faith in Jesus. And I want to take a moment. I want to pray over you and all of you who are asking God, I, I want that seed of resurrection life planted inside of me. And I want to live not for today, but forever. Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you that you face death so that we would never have to die forever in judgment. God, thank you that in your death, 
You freed us from the grip of sin and in your resurrection, you put death to death. You are a death killer. God, thank you for the victory that we have through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, for every one of us, as resurrection life is being planted inside of us, shift our focus so that we don't live only for today, but we live forever. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.